uh, Shinnecock.com, particularly for you golfers, that's S-H-I-N-N-E-C-O-C-K.com. Um, I, yes, like Gary, uh, went to the Boston Trade School. I then went to Wall Street, where I started a raft of different businesses, ultimately ended up uh, running, or maybe they're running me, pretty much all the product areas for what became Morgan Stanley. Uh, with endless mergers. Uh, there, I one of the things I think was kind of fun was with a couple of other people started the Discover card. Uh, clearly, you can tell I can't hold a job. Uh, then I said, there's no fun. So I quit and started Shinnecock Partners, a small family office. I knew Wall Street never met a fee they didn't like and uh, casual about risk. I had a few pennies and I didn't want to lose it. Lord knows as a young man, I embodied both of those things. Uh, came out to California years ago to uh, get my head handed to me and spent seven years restructuring this $20 billion company. Yep, Some yep. of you may be young enough to remember a first executive. And then- Hey, Alan, can you speak up? Alan, can you speak up a little bit? I'm not sure if your volume is up. I think we're going to turn the volume up in the in the room here, but if you can just All speak right. up a little bit more. I'll try. Is that better? Uh, no, we got to fix something in the room here. Just, get, just keep on going. I'll, All I'll, right. I'll, I'll get the tech person to turn it up. <laughs> okay. And uh, then, and this is germane for the latter part of my uh, conversation this, this afternoon, I had the temerity, I said, if you could give people the ability to compare insurance policies head to head, you might have a business. It was a little harder to execute than my peanut brain allowed. And uh, eventually, however, created this insurance exchange and we became the largest seller of auto and home in the US using the web and call centers. I'm happy to report like the earlier panelists uh, Allstate owns the company today. God bless them. And uh, most recently, which I'll get to at the end of this chatter, uh, we just started another company called A Share X, the Art Share Exchange. Now, Marty said, Snyder, you got to talk about how you got into the art business. Uh, that was eight years ago. A friend of mine running a large credit fund said, Alan, you like niche stuff. I do because I think it's anti-fragile like uh, Nassim Taleb writes about. And I was looking for yield investments and they were few and far between without undue risk. And they had a hundred million dollar book of loans against museum quality fine art. Wow. Uh, let me put it in context. As I listened to this morning, Marty, I wanted to slip my wrist after listening to some of the early speakers. They talked about the macro environment. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. Um, inflation is high. They believe it's going to get a lot worse. Clearly, there is great uncertainty for all of us. The neat thing about lending against fine art, you're dealing with a hard asset and you're lending at pretty modest, low, low LTVs, loan to the value of the collateral. And uh, that's pretty good. We'll talk about that. And then of course, there's the newfound thing of investing in art directly, ownership of art. We'll talk about that in a minute. Museum quality fine art. I love this as a lender because museum quality fine art, think Picasso, Basquiat, Bacon, et cetera, has enduring value. It generally appreciates over time, depending on who you ask, six to 8%. And really warming my black heart is the fact that art is a global asset. It's like gold. It moves around. Is that better? That's better? Okay. Alan, we just turned up your volume. 
Oh, good. <laughs> now you can start over. Just kidding. <laughs> My condolences for anybody that can now listen. Art's a global asset. It moves around with currency fluctuations. So if the U.S. market is crummy, you can sell the art in Hong Kong. Now, who borrows? Who are the borrowers? We have focused mostly about 85% of our loan book, and we've got a $130 million loan book today. Our dealers and gallerists love them as borrowers because in the art world, if you lose your reputation by playing games, you're out of the business. So a gallerist and dealer has an extra incentive to play it straight with their lender, that be us. What are they doing? They're, they're basically very prosaic in one sense. We're doing inventory finance. Now, here's a typical loan. I'll give you one that we're currently thinking about. There's a Medigliani that was purchased for uh, 35 million, another Bacon that was purchased for 50 million a few years ago. Current appraised value is 90 million. The borrower is, in this case, a billionaire, which will sign, who will sign a personal guarantee. Wow. And wants a $30 million loan against that. And we would basically earn somewhere between a 10 and 11% yield. Now we have two vehicles. One is a pooled vehicle. Here's a shocker for anybody that's an investor in credit stuff. One Saturday, I said to myself, geez, I don't see too many credit rated, agency rated credit funds. I said, gee, I wonder if we can get this bloody thing credit rated. And to my delight, we did. And to my pleasant shock, it was rated A plus, investment grade. That vehicle is clocking along at about an 8% yield with a 38% average loan to value with approximately a four month duration. The typical loan we make is a one year term loan where the borrower pays the interest upfront, reducing the loan proceeds. Then the borrower also pays the insurance costs. And here's an important thing. They pay the storage costs. We're a hard asset lender. We take control of the asset and keep it in an art warehouse, bonded, climate controlled fire suppression. So if somebody doesn't pay us back, we haven't had that problem yet, but someday we will. We control the art, we file a UCC one against it, and then we will sell the art. And at the LTVs I mentioned, that gives us a lot of room to be wrong. Now, we're anal. <laughs> we do endless due diligence on the art. We get an invoice, chain of title. We make sure to have an export certificate in case we want to move the art somewhere else to be sold. We get a fair market value appraisal. We get expert opinions about the provenance of the art. We get an exhibition history on the art. And frequently, for those of you, I wish I could see the audience, I don't know if you're familiar with the catalog raisonne where the artist or the foundation for the artist says, aha, that picture of that handsome guy, Marty Cicada, we did it. That's, that's uh, Marty, I don't know if we can find any art with you in it, but we should. Uh, now, <laughs> so, that's what we're doing. We have, as I said, the pooled vehicle. It's a pretty nifty structure. I don't have time to go into it. It's very unusual. There is no UCI, effectively connected income, ECI, excuse me. So an offshore investor, you don't have the two point drag of a Cayman feeder. That's powerful. For a tax qualified account in the US, 
there is no UBTI. And for a taxable US investor, this is pretty neat. As some of you know, there's a little ugly surprise that happens with credit, many credit funds. A K-1 comes out and you go, ooh, what's this extra charge? And the extra charge turns out to be investment expenses, which is not tax deductible for most. In our vehicle, it is tax deductible. That saves our investors about another 1%. So that's the pooled vehicle. And yes, it's monthly, it's open, it's got an administrator, it's audited, et cetera. So it has all the controls of my uh, past, a, you know, a billion dollar fund, it's got all of those controls. Now we also do sidecars because that fund, I'm typically the largest investor in what Shinnecock does. That fund has self-imposed limits of no more than 15% to any single borrower or any single artist. That has meant since we get bigger loans brought to us like the Modigliani one I mentioned, if the fund has any cash, we participate and we sell the rest of the loan as straight out participations because those loans are less diversified by borrower and art. They have typically a higher yield, sometimes with very delicious, a profit participation on top. So the yield on those is somewhere between nine and 11%. So it's higher than the pooled vehicle. The pooled, we have about 230 pieces of art that we've lent against in our possession. So that's lending against fine art. Now, for years, 18 months ago, I had this crazy idea of how to disrupt the art market. That is this new company that we've formed called Asurex. I said, imagine if you could take a $10 million Picasso and give people the opportunity to own great art, which they may not have the $10 million to do. Let's fractionalize the art. And we do a bunch of things through a securities offering. Wow democratizing the art world. To do this, we did as a starter kit when I was over the last 18 months talking to people, they, I said, talk me off the ledge. I need to start another company like a hole in the head. And they said, Alan, not only should you do this, you got to take our money. So we did a safe Marty for $3 million. Now, in addition, we wanna do a $10 million series A. However, having invested in endless VC deals personally, you get an A round, a B round, a C round, a D round, and it can take bloody forever. I think the series A round for this company will be once and done because the company is intrinsically will be so profitable. We anticipate launching this puppy in the end of the first quarter in 2023. All right, I'm a bigot about it. I admit it. Whether it was the Discover card or the insurance exchange, I think this is the best company out of the 20 I've started, clearly a serial entrepreneur, that I've ever done. It's disruptive innovation. Let me just tick off a few things. Marty, if we can get the video to play the last time we talked, we weren't able to, but I'll try. Here's what we're doing in this company. We're establishing a trusted marketplace for buying and selling fractional shares of physical art. The physical art market is $1.7 trillion outstanding, about 65 to 80 million in current transactions every year. So we'll create that marketplace. We will also create an auction process for fair market, true market pricing of the art. Not some intermediary saying, Marty, this is what we say the artists work. We're gonna do it with an auction allowing 
the fractional bidders to participate and compete against 100% bidders. In addition, we will create a secondary market for ongoing liquidity. Maybe you buy a fractional share for $100,000, $50,000, you need a new roof on your house, we will create a secondary market so you can sell your shares. Now, we also have a hard opinion. Art, as some of you may know, has a collectible tax of 28%. However, if you sell the shares in the secondary market, the tax will be like on securities or a 20% capital gains tax, a real benefit. Basically, what are we doing? We're democratizing the art market by expanding ownership access for art that's otherwise unattainable in museum quality art. This delivers a huge new pool of buyers. You may not know the statistics, 90% of all auctions are for art less than $50,000, even though high-end art has the best appreciation potential, lower volatility, and less downside. Wow, we're going to give people for the first time a chance to participate and control their asset, not with some intermediary saying, no, Alan, you're too stupid to do it. We'll do it for you. It will increase and make it more attractive for art sellers. We will use Series A plus shares to do this with an SEC license transfer agent, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what are we doing at a fundamental level? We're empowering for the first time the art buyer. We are giving the art buyer, since we've been in the lending business for a long time, all of the information that we typically, typically get before we would extend a loan. Most art buyers never get that all the stuff that I detailed earlier. Second, there will be no expensive third-party money manager intermediary. We're giving all of the control to the shareholders. What does that mean? It means that they can sell the art, they can sell their shares when they choose, and secondarily, if they want to sell the underlying art, they make the decision by a majority vote. Wow. The art world, opaque and expensive. We will lower the frictional expenses of art ownership sharply. If I were to compare what we're doing, Masterworks has done a great job of talking about as a money manager, they're a money manager. We're not, we're an exchange with an auction system. We're giving the power to the art owner and our costs are 75% less giving higher return potential to the players involved. Now, we can leverage our access that we have today to art. All these gallerists and dealers are very excited. In addition, we've already struck the deal with Bonhams, the fourth largest auction house, who almost every few days calls me and says, Alan, hurry up and get the damn thing built because we wanna use it very powerful for us and they will bring their clientele to the platform. Now, for fun, and it, we'll see if we can get this done, Marty. Um, I'm gonna see if we can uh, crank up this video, which is far more eloquent, eloquent than I am. All right, share the screen now. Hmm, let's see if I can move that out of the way. Let's we'll see if we can get this to work. We have not succeeded in the past, we'll see. All right, 
Let's see. Play. Mention the words fine art, and most of us think of museums and galleries. But fine art can be a fine investment. Art represents an investable asset class, and savvy investors have been reaping the rewards for many, many years. Global investments in physical art are estimated at $1.7 trillion, more than the entire private debt market. Trackable annual art sales total $65 billion, with low correlation to both the S&P 500 and interest rates, purchasing fine art diversifies investment portfolios. Art is an attractive asset over the long run because it can generate a positive real return. Experts calculate the art market has returned 8% annually since 1972 and 5.5% since 2002. Higher priced artworks are generally more liquid and, given their scarcity, can offer better returns than speculative lower priced artworks. Art is only 2% of total investable assets. Therefore, there is much room to grow for individual investment portfolios. While it's true that fine art has been a great investment, it's been unattainable for most of us until now. We want to give people the chance to invest in an asset class that's been great for very, very wealthy people, but not available to many others. And that's our goal in Asherex, to give them the chance to do something they've never been able to do before. The chance to buy into great art that has enduring value, value that appreciates over time. And that's what led to fractionalizing the ownership of these great pieces of art. The goal of any professional asset allocator, which is what we're asked to do, is to search for enhanced risk return profiles for investments. And so we're really looking to add return without adding a lot of risk into the portfolio at the same time. One thing we love about Share X is that you're going from a market that was really only the most affluent of affluent people who could afford this art to bringing it down and democratizing the space. Now you're allowing that store of value of wealth to be passed on to an entirely different subset of investors. Let's have some fun exploring AshareX's virtual gallery. It's in the metaverse and open to all. Here, you can view the artworks you and others may have purchased, browse current and upcoming auctions, and for the first time, find most everything needed to make an informed purchase of fine art. Imagine accessing critical information in one easy to use place. We include thorough due diligence about the artwork, a current fair market valuation by a pedigreed appraiser, a condition report, details about the artist, the artwork's provenance, recognized expert opinions, exhibition history, and a publication list. The A Share X auction allows bidders to purchase as many fractional interests as desired in a particular artwork. True flexibility. Purchases can be made online or by telephone with market or limit bids similar to a traditional stock exchange. With modest price points, dramatically lower costs of ownership than those offered by others, and a transparent bidding process, finally, everyone can prudently own fine art. After purchasing an ownership interest, you receive a limited edition NFT that includes a high resolution image of the artwork you own, which can be displayed on a television or a digital picture frame at home or even in your office. And if you decide you want to sell ownership interest for any reason, the control is in your hands thanks to our secondary marketplace and its special tax benefits. The very best art to invest in is the very most valuable art. And that takes it out of the price range of all but the very wealthiest people. What a ShareX brings to this is the concept of being able to buy a share, let's say a 100 share. If one can do that, it's a great part of a portfolio. Asherex would allow a whole level of investors to become involved with the purchase of investment quality art 
which would expand the market and would be to the benefit of everybody on the seller side. In my opinion, buying a fractional interest of an asset with long-lasting real-world value is better than owning a purely digital offering like a Ford Ape or a CryptoKitty, because you don't know if those are going to drop down to zero overnight. We've seen this happen before, whereas paintings and great pieces of art, those have been around for hundreds of years, been great stores of value for hundreds of years, and are quite uncorrelated with the rest of the market. HRX team has a great track record in terms of art investments. You have not only one, let's say, advisor that is telling you this is a good uh, asset that you should invest in, but you actually have a consortium, a committee of different people that are all relevant into the art space that are going to give uh, their own opinion. So it's like a vetting process if you want to see it that way. And that is what makes the investment itself much more concrete and secure. And it's bringing art to the masses and it's also giving everybody an opportunity to participate and buy high quality or museum quality artworks. That's never happened before. It's really transformation. There's an opportunity for everybody, no matter where they are. You could be in Kansas and bidding on a Picasso. What could be more exciting? It's really an exciting opportunity for both art collectors and investors. And what it will do, it will expand the auction market for not just Bonhams, but I think for all the auction houses. HREX is the answer for a marriage of the traditional auction house and the new young collectors. Whether you're a first time art buyer, a seasoned collector, a seller, or a traditional investor, fine art is now accessible to everyone and diversification is made simple. A Share X, fine art for all. Well, there you have it. That's what we're about. Um, I've never been more excited. And a um, couple things about it. Do I have, how much time do I have, Marty, if any? <laughs> Marty. Well. Oh. Oh, uh, uh, two, minutes. two minutes. Okay, let me wrap it up. When I built the insurance exchange, I said you have to have a low cost of customer acquisition. Here we will partner with aggregators of art buyers, whether that's auction houses like Bonhams or the other major players. That will give us a very attractive cost structure. Second, and this is pretty interesting. If you think about what we're doing, this functionality does not exist today. We've been hard at building it. That auction system to allow fractional bidders with 100% bidders, we had to create that. That's unusual. We will file, are in the process of filing a patent on it. Moreover, can you imagine, <laughs> maybe for our investors, what we're doing will become extremely attractive. Unlike Answer Financial, the insurance exchange, there weren't a hell of a lot of players that had enough money to buy it. Here, you've got comps, whether imagine if Open Seas with a $13 billion valuation owned what we're doing, they would command the art market. Similarly so for the other auction houses. Uh, so there are endless exits. As I get asked, could we apply all the technology we're putting in place today? Would it apply to collectibles? Yes, we have a collectible company that's quite interested in what we're doing. That's another possibility. Clearly, 
collectible cars, everything we're doing has perfect application there. And or even, oh my goodness, back to my youth where I created a large real estate syndicator, real estate. So that's what we're doing. Very excited about it because I think the exits as the earlier panel talked about are compelling. Um, and I think relatively near term future. Um, so there you have it. Uh, we started the marketing for the $10 million about two weeks ago, two and a half, maybe three weeks ago. And uh, we have some serious interest in case any of you are interested, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, thanks, Marty. Always a pleasure. Yeah. Marty, we, at least I can't hear you. I don't know if anybody else can. What's your time frame? Well, having started too many things, I'd love to get the money done as quickly as possible because I regard raising the money. Don't take this offense to anybody. The faster we get it done, then I can devote 100% of time with the team that we have in place. We have a team that has played at the largest scale CIO, a CMO, um, and others, and it's, um, all sorts of people beavering away at this thing. So the sooner we get the money raised, the better. That's that's what I would say. Uh, thanks so much, Alan. Thank you, everybody.